Tonight, I want to talk to you from the heart of God. I want to I bring you no opinion, but I want you to consider the truth in God's word. Tonight, I want to talk to you about there's more in 2024. There's more in 2024. There's more. And again, I know that sounds cliche, but I want you to consider that God is a God of more. God is a God that is always leading us into more. The Bible says that we go from faith to faith. The scriptures declare that we go from one uh, understanding of glory to another level of glory. In other words, God is always on the move and he's always leading us to higher ground. He's always causing us to stretch. He's always uh, uh, equipping us in such a way that we're supposed to grow. And so I don't know about you, but 2023 was all right. It was good. But God has more. God has more. How many of you are excited about the word more? Don't lie. You know you like the word more. You like the word more. In, in 2024, we're declaring this, that this is a year of more. More growth. More maturity. More experience in God's blessing. More advancement in all the Lord's purposes, more increase unto you, but also more increase through your life. But let me just say this as a word of caution that's very important for us to consider because it's easy to get excited about more. Yes! Man, I got a word from God. He's got more. But to experience more, the more that God has in store for you, you have to understand that there has to be more room in you. There has to be more room in you. Truthfully, you know, it's interesting tonight before we, we're going to take communion a little bit, but the disciples thought that, you know, like, this is it. We've got Jesus and he's going to become a king and he's going to lead the way for Israel and he's going to crush Rome and he's going to do all these things. And he says, no, guys, I'm leaving but there's another one that's going to come in my place, and he's going to lead you. He's going to show you. And I've got to leave so that he can come. But it was also that they could go to a next level of experience and walk in their faith and their journey with God. In other words, God was, Jesus was leading them towards more. And if there's going to be more of an experience in what God has for you and I, there needs to be an expansion within us. I remember years ago, we did a summer camp. Uh, we had just started the church back then. We did a summer camp, and we, we took 20 kids for the summer, and they came a couple of days during the week. And at the end of the week, we would always go on a trip. Um, and I remember one of those trips on a Friday, we went, uh, we took them out. We did like a really big outdoor game day at JFK, at, at, uh, JFK Park. Uh, down in Westchester, and then uh, we, we, after that, uh, we took them to the pool to go swim. And so while we were at the park, in, in, in the pool swimming, um, you know, me being Pastor Jose and me being competitive, uh, I started, you know, kind of jiving with the kids in the pool, and we, I said, I bet you, I told this one kid, I told her, uh, her name is Ely, who she's not a kid anymore, she's an adult now, right, she's adulting these days, she's working, She's, she's a daughter of the house, but she's an adult now, so I struggle to treat her like an adult. But anyway, Ely was in the pool, and we were all hanging out and having fun. And I said, I bet you that I can hold my breath on the water and swim further than you. And I was just talking trash. This, this kid was a swimming, uh, uh, she, she was an accomplished swimmer uh, in high school, and she competed in states and all kinds of stuff. So I knew she was going to kick my tail. But I was just messing around. And so, but I really thought that I could hold my breath a long time. So she said, all right, let's do it. So we go in like 10 seconds into it. I'm already up gasping for air. And she's still swimming underwater. And I'm like, what? How is that possible? And, and this, this is a very wide pool. Right? She's swimming. And she comes out. And, you know, the kids are all laughing. I'm like, all right, let's do it again. And get all the kids in. And I'm like gasping for air, trying to just you know, breathe. But what's interesting is the reason why I remember this is because her lungs had more capacity than mine. 
you see, she had exercised the lungs within her to such an extent that she could endure underwater longer than me and swim further than me. She had more capacity than me because she had exercised something within her. And friends, the same is true for us. The Bible says that we are to work out our own salvation in reverence unto God. We're supposed to work out our salvation. In other words, there is, there is something great that God has deposited in you. The problem is many of us don't know it. That's why the Bible says that it is for lack of knowledge that his people perish. See, there's more to know. There's more to grow. But there needs to be an expansion within us. And in the same way that Eli had expanded her lungs within, we must exercise our internal God-given nature to expand our capacity to step into more. Reminds me of Matthew chapter 25, verse 29, where the Lord Jesus made this statement. He says, for to everyone who has, for to everyone who has, and some of us feel like, I don't have. But if you read this in context, he's talking about he's given everyone ability. And he says to everyone who has. Now, you may have ability, but ability that isn't used is ability that is dormant. It's dying. It's wasted. And so when he talks about everyone who has, he's not talking about you have ability. He's talking about everybody who's using this ability. And he says for who, for, to everyone who has, more will be given. And he will have abundance, but from him who does not have, who is not using what God has placed in them, what the talents, the gifts, the, the, the experiences, the understanding, the anointing, the wisdom of God, the callings of God, the, the person who's not using them, this person does not have even what he has will be taken away. All this simply to say that God designed you and I for a greater measure, for more. But it depends on your faithfulness to use your current measure, which is a portion to you. Quick question. What is Jesus saying to you at this moment? What is Jesus saying to you and I at this very moment? What is he speaking to your life? What is the measure that he's telling you that is a tool for him to take you to a place called more. What are you doing with that? Are you growing in that? Are you expanding your understanding? Are you seeking? And so for the next couple of moments that I have, I want to give you a few things to, to, to meditate on, to leave here. Hey, if you're taking notes, I want you to write these things down. If you've got your phone, it's on the app. You've got notes play, somewhere you could take notes in your phone. Maybe you've got your notebook. I like journals. I, like the, I, I, I do this kind of stuff all the time. Um, but I want to encourage you to take notes because today we're going to lean into God's word. And the first thing that I want to encourage you to meditate on as we consider the word of God is that new levels, this place called more, requires living a new life. New levels require living a new life. Now, I know that sounds... You know, that doesn't sound very appealing. It doesn't sound very exciting. It's not a big, heavy revy, but I want you to consider where I'm coming from with this. Imagine what it must be like for a baby when its mother births it. For nine months, this baby has been in complete comfort where everything is familiar, the warmth of the womb, the mom's heartbeat, the continued flow of nutrition, the voices, the sounds, all cuddled, and all of a sudden, the familiar collapses. All that was familiar, all that was comfortable, that all collapses. It changes as this baby is being sucked out of the womb by violent contractions and hands that begin to pull at it. Is it any wonder that babies come out crying? Now, this is just a visual analogy, but I want you to consider that th this illustrates the dramatic change that we have endured from going from death to life in Christ. We have been snatched out of the hands of death. We've been snatched out of the hands of sin. We've been snatched out of the plans of Satan. We've been pulled out of that. We've been sucked out of that and brought into a new life. And as we step into this new life, we have to face a new reality. 
We've been brought into a life in Christ that requires that we shift from a life hidden in the comfort of our former lives into an entirely new life. Let me put it to you this way. When the Bible says that you are a new creation, it also means you're supposed to live a new way. Something has to change. We have to embrace a new way. We have to begin to live a new life. Everybody wants more, but few want to do what's necessary. You have to live an entirely different way. An entirely different way. There's a new life available to you and I. Now, unless you think I'm giving you an opinion here, listen to what the scriptures say in Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 22. It says that you put off concerning your former conduct. The way you used to do things. The old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust. Do you realize what the scripture is telling us there? That the way we used to think, the way we used to live, the way we used to do things before we were in Christ was corrupt. It was contaminated. It was, it, it was, it was infectious. It was no good. And he says, you have to put that off because that way leads you to deceitful lusts. Lust is strong desires, but notice that it says they're deceitful lusts. They're desires that lie to us. And if we entertain them long enough, they will deceive us. Verse 23 goes on to say, and so therefore be renewed in the spirit of your mind. In other words, start with a renewal that begins from within. It's the reason why the Apostle Paul prayed in Ephesians 1 that the eyes of our heart would be open, that we would know the power of God towards us, that we would know the inheritance that he's laid up for us amongst the saints. In other words, there's something that God has already done in you. It's already done. It's already provided. You are already anointed. You are already appointed. You are already ready. But here's the thing. You have to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. In other words, you have to become acquainted with the inner work. You can't stretch your capacity if you don't know what's there. Can't grow into that. And he goes on to say, and that you put on, somebody say put on. Tell, tell three people, put on. Put on what? Let me tell you what we're supposed to put on. Put on the new man. Put on this new creation. It's already in you, but you got to start wearing this. You got to pull it out the closet. You got to come out the womb. You know who are the only ones that want to stay in the womb? Babies. Babies want to stay in the womb. Babies want to stay in comfort. Babies don't want to grow. Babies just want milk. Babies just want to be tended to. That's why they really come out crying. Because they just want to stay in there. But I guarantee you this. You look at any baby that's not growing, and anyone in their right and logical mind will tell you something's wrong. What makes us think that it's any different for us as Christians? And so verse 24 says, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. That's you. That's who you really are. You are truly righteous and holy in God's sight. Many of us are still living wayward, struggling, messing up, making mistakes. Not because, not, not, not simply because of our flaws. It's because we don't know who we really are. It's because we don't see what God sees. And we don't conform to what God says. And so according to the scripture, what we see is that we are made new creations in Christ, but it's for a new life, not an old life. And the best way to experience a new life in Christ, listen to this, is to start doing the new things that his word tells us. Let me give you a good example of that. We're not going to look at it in scripture. But you go look at it, uh, uh, Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 7. And what you're going to see is that Jesus is talking to people. 
And he's literally giving us an example of this point that I'm making. He says, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, love your enemies. Forgive them. And he says many things, you've heard it said, but I say. In other words, what he was saying is, this is the way you've done it, but let me tell you how it's supposed to be. In other words, there is a new way. I'm going to say something that may ruffle some feathers here. There is no way, no way that we can hear the word of God if we're truly hearing and leave the same. Question, what change will you leave with tonight? What changes will you make? What new things will you do? Because last time I checked, the only way kids grow is by doing something they've never done before. Kids learn by hands-on experience. So do we. You want to grow? It's not how much more of the Bible you know. It's not about how many services you come to and how many times you serve and how much you give and how much Bible verses you can quote. It's not about how many songs you sing in worship. It's not about how much time you pray. None of that. None of that in and of itself is a recipe for growth. Jesus, the, the scripture says, and don't just be hearers of the word, be doers. You know why? Because doing trumps hearing. Doing completes what you heard. It makes it actionable. It causes growth. It's for that reason that Jesus warns us. We're not going to look at the scripture, but I'm going to reference it. Jesus said, you can't pour new wine into old wineskins. You can't take this new creation and try and pour yourself into old ways, into old habits, into old beliefs, into old systems. You can't do it. Why? Because it's always going to burst. Now, maybe there's someone here, maybe you're online and you're, you, you feel like your life keeps going bust. It's because you don't belong in an old wineskin. You got to live a new life. You want more? Because God does. You got to live different. And for whoever's here tonight, whoever's online, and whenever you, you catch this or if you go back and listen to it, listen to the word of God. I created you as a new creation. The old is passed away. Behold, all things are become new. God doesn't want you in the old. He's calling you and I to a new way of life. Something's got to change. Amen? Yeah. Y'all right with that? Yeah. You know I love you, right? Yeah. I know you love me. Because you're still here. No, nobody's walked out yet. Maybe you tuned off online, but... No worries. Not my opinion. It's God's word. The second point I want to leave you with here is that new levels, this thing called more, new levels require new depths. You know, in Ezekiel chapter 47, the prophet Ezekiel has this vision that God gives him. And if you read this in context, what you'll see is that the, the purpose of the vision was to demonstrate how God wanted to lead his people to healing, to restoration, to redemption. And so the imagery that God gives them in this vision is that he's walking with a man, the man being the spirit of God, God himself. And in this vision, the man is leading him to deeper waters. And at the very depths of the water is the place of healing. But what does this teach us? about the more that God has for us. What is it that God is saying to you and I about going deeper? Well, let me read it to you. Ezekiel chapter 47, starting at verse 3 says, And when the man went out 
to the east with the line in his hand. It was a measuring rod, is the way the, the, the original language puts it. He measured 1,000 cubits, and he brought me through the water. So here's the, here's the picture. Here's what's happening. The man measures out 1,000 cubits, and he says, we're going to walk this far. And so he walks that with this man in this vision, and it says that he brought him through waters, and the water came up to my ankles. I got this. Piece of cake. Got this. I can walk this with you, God. Then he goes on to say, verse 4, again he measured another thousand. And he brought me through the waters, and the water came up to my knees. I got this. I'm with you, God. This is good. I'm right here with you. I'll follow you. Then he goes on and he says, and again he measured another thousand, and he brought me through, and the water came up to my waist. I got this. I'm good. I'm, I'll follow you, God. All good. I'm with you, Lord, all the way. I'll go wherever you take me, Lord, whatever you're calling me to do. But then it goes on to say, verse 5, somebody say, again. 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 He measured another thousand, and it was a river that I could not cross. I don't have this. I can't do this. I don't have control here. I can't navigate this in my own strength. For the water was too deep. Water in which one must swim. You know what's interesting about swimming in rivers? You have to swim with the current. You can swim against it for a little bit. But you will tire out. And after that, he, say, he says, a river that could not be crossed. What's the point that I'm making here? We're talking about new levels. This place called Moor requires new depths. See, what God was demonstrating to him that is still relevant and true today is that our healing and health can only occur when we no longer have control because we're following God's spirit to do what works only in his control. King David put it this way as a young boy. He said, it's not by might. He says, you come at me with a sword and a spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. I'm not coming in my strength. I can only do this in God's strength. And the only way that you can find health, the only way that you can find healing, the only way that you can experience restoration, the only way that you can grow, the only way that you can mature, the only way that you could step into all that God has for you in 2024 and even beyond is if you live in a way where God has ultimate control. You know what that looks like? It's not God. It's in your control. I got nothing to do with this. You do what you want. It's not going to work that way. No, it's God. You're in control. What do you want me to do? What does your word instruct me to do with my life? What does that look like for me as a parent, as a wife, as a husband, as a business leader, as a politician, as a teacher, as a, as a mother, as a friend, as a Christian, as a servant, as a neighbor. See, that's why the Spirit led Ezekiel to a depth he could no longer walk in. Friends, here's the truth. Following Jesus will never lead us to do something within our control and strength. You know why? Because when it's in our control, I guarantee you this, it will spiral out of control. It will. Oh, you may be happy because, you know, I'm, I'm in a new season. I'm, I'm doing something new. I'm, I'm finally where I wanted to be, but you won't be whole. I really do believe that there was something to what Pastor Nett was saying earlier about running. 
if you're running towards comfort, you're conned. Show me in the Bible where Jesus leads you to comfort. You won't find it. You won't find it. He'll lead you to rest. But you know what rest looks like according to the scriptures? Oh, you're learning from him and you're walking with him. And here's the the example that he uses. It's like two bulls walking together treading ground. There's nothing easy about that. You hear me? Listen to what the scripture says, lest you think I'm giving you an opinion. Ephesians 3.17 says, May Christ, through your faith, actually dwell. Settle down, abide, make his permanent home in your hearts. May you be rooted deep in love and founded securely on love. Watch what happens in the deep. He says, that you may have the power and be strong to apprehend and grasp with all the saints, God's devoted people, the experience of that love. What is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of it? That you may really come to know practically through experience for yourselves the love of Christ, which far surpasses mere knowledge without experience. That you may be filled through all your being unto all the fullness of God. You may have the richest measure of the divine presence and become a body wholly filled and flooded with God himself. You know what the scripture is telling us here? It's saying that the purpose of going deep with God is to become like him. It's to be filled with his nature, with his purposes. Not just with his love. Not just to know that you're loved, but to grow because you're loved. But to follow because you're loved. But to live sacrificially because you're loved. Because he's worthy. See, going deeper with Jesus ultimately ultimately will lead to more growth. So let me ask you a question. If you were to equate where you are in your life and in your desires right now, Where you are in the midst of that vision, are you ankle deep? Are you knee deep? Are you waist deep? Or are you in a place where you have to trust God and you have to do it God's way? According to what we see in the book of Ezekiel, the right way is the way where you can't do it alone. Where you have to depend on Jesus. Amen? Amen? New levels, this place called more requires, say this with me, new thinking. New thinking. New thinking. I don't think the old way I used to. Listen to what Romans 12, verses 1 and 2 says. It says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies dedicating all of yourselves set apart as a living what? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. Yeah, I get it. That's not exciting. (laughs) There's nothing exciting about that. Nah, I'm I'm, I'm good. Nah, I'm not looking to be no sacrifice. They had sheep for that, right? I'm I'm not, not me. Sacrifice. It says that we're to present ourselves a living sacrifice. In other words, daily, we should be living sacrificially for his purposes. Daily, we should be sacrificing our way for his way. Daily, we should revolve our mindsets, our lives around his purposes, his plans, this new life that he teaches us to live. He goes on to say, as living sacrifices, holy and well-pleasing to God, which is your rational, logical, intelligent act of worship. But here's the kicker, verse 2. It says, and do not be conformed to this world. To be conformed, according to the original language here, is the equivalent of taking liquid and pouring it into a bottle. And the Water takes the shape of whatever it's poured into. That's what conforming means. 
Do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs. But be, say this with me, transformed. Be transformed. Be transformed. And watch what transformation looks like. And progressively changed as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes so that you may prove for yourselves what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan and purpose for you. See, as we start living according to this new life that we have and we continue to go deeper in, where, in what God's spirit is leading us towards, we begin to eventually live sacrificially. But here's the thing. God said, I don't desire sacrifice. I don't, I don't want your, your sacrifices. Sacrifice isn't enough. No, he wants our heart. That's the work within. That's what Romans 12, 2 is talking about. The reason why I say that is because we can't stop at just the sacrifices we make externally. The next step for more requires that we stop conforming our thinking, our beliefs to the culture of this world so that we can start the process of life transformation. In other words, here's what the scripture is telling us. The only way to be transformed is to undergo a renovation, not just of your mind, but of where you pour yourself into. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm finishing up my master's degree now in Christian leadership, and I'm in a class um, where I'm reading a book. <laughs> Wasn't for that, but thank you. I'm reading a book right now. One of the texts that I'm reading for a class that I'm taking is called Gentle Shepherding. And I was like, oh, this is going to be a great book. Great. Let me talk about people's feelings and all that. And I'm, I'm reading it. And it's actually a very challenging book. It's, it's one, it's academic writing. So it's, I'm like, okay, what does this word mean? <laughs> and, and okay, let me, let me back up and let me, let me really, uh, what did that say? Okay, let me back up. And uh, so it's, I'm reading it. But there's a point that the author's making in, in this, the, 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 the doctor's making in this particular textbook where he's talking about culture. And he talks about how the reason why the scripture calls us to love one another so much, why, why Jesus emphasized so much that we should become one, that we're not in this world, that we're in this world, but we're not of this world, that we're to be separate, right? That we're to really grow as a body and nurture one another is because wherever you place yourself, there's always culture that you're pulling from it. There are values, there are beliefs, there are norms, there are things that we adapt to. And so for this reason, the scripture says, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world. Can I just encourage you with just some very practical advice based on the scriptures? Be careful who you're in relationship with. I get it. You got to work with people, but that doesn't mean you have to become like them. Be careful who your circle is because your circle determines your cycle in life. Be careful. See, Jesus says, you want to, I want you to be transformed. God says, I want you to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But that can't happen if you're constantly conforming in different areas that give you culture, different culture. And what happens is when we pull from here and we pull from there and we take from here and we take from there, we're living in something called mixture. And mixture doesn't work because mixture will mix you up. It'll mess you up. It'll confuse you. We got to be mindful of that. That makes sense? And so new thinking conform to the word of God and the ways of God will lead us to new levels according to what we just read. It tells us that not only will we be transformed, but the transformation will be according to the good 
and perfect and pleasing will of God. I don't know about you, but the type of change that I want and I believe that you want is not change that you can affect on your own. It's change that is aligned with God's will. We need that kind of change. The last point I want to leave you with here is simply this. New levels require less in other areas. New levels, more, requires less in other areas. See, the other side of more in your life is less in another area of your life. I want to read to you something that I woke up with before we take communion. I want to read you something that was pressing upon my heart that I believe is a word from the Lord. Before I read it to you, I want to give you the scripture that I woke up with. I thought my message was done on Sunday. On Sunday, we ended with John 15. And I was touching on a particular portion of the scripture, but I woke up New Year's Day, January 1st. And when I woke up, what I woke up was with John 15, and I was meditating on the words of the Lord. And then I just felt that there were some specific things that he was saying to me. But then I realized it's also for us. We didn't put it up on the screen, but I just want to read it to you. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. He cuts off every branch that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, listen to this, he prunes it. He cuts away at it so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. In other words, what you believe deep within your heart about me. Remain in me, and I also remain as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. In other words, you, you die away. Become useless. Produce nothing. He says, such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me, verse 7, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. I want to read to you what I believe the Holy Spirit gave me. And I'm literally reading to you word for word what I feel the Lord gave me to write down. 2024 is a year for more with me. But that calls for less in other areas of your life. What has to become less for me to become more in your life? What character traits, desires, ambitions, personal priorities have to decrease so I can increase in you? When Jesus says, I am the branch, he says, well, here's what I wrote. I am the branch that is a part of Christ, the vine, and we are in the Father's vineyard. Listen to what that means. Jesus is the vine. We're the branches. But we're in a place that's the garden of the Lord. In other words, the Father, and the scripture says that the Father tends to his vine. And the reason why the Father plants a vineyard and he tends to it is because our Father desires fruit. And fruit represents more. It represents greater harvests. It represents vineyards to come. See, the path to more is through pruning that leaves the branches 
with less. Listen to what the Lord is telling us. I want more for you, but less has to, there are less, there are things that have to become less in your life. In other words, there are things that I am going to cut away, and you're not going to like it. You're not going to like it. It may be people. It may be mindsets that you hold to because that's all you know. It might be a way of doing things because that's the way we always did it and that's the way it's always been done and that's what people want me to do and that's how I've been taught. And that's how that, that, that's what's normal and acceptable. But no. The Father prunes every branch so that it can bear fruit. Listen to what this means for 2024. There are some things that are going to be cut out of your life and mine that we're not going to like. Those things have to be cut away. They have to be cut away. They have to be cut away. And as I was meditating on this, I feel the Lord said to me, I don't want you to bear fruit in every area. I didn't create you to bear fruit in every area and everything in your life. Listen, listen to why he said this. Because fruitfulness is for specific areas of the vine. Specific parts of the branch produce fruit. And there are areas in a branch where there's fruit, but he goes, I got to cut that. Because I'm after more fruit. I don't want just what looks like fruit. I want what's going to produce fruit for a harvest. For years to come. For the remainder of your life. Jesus says we're already clean. Why? Because of the fact that we've believed in him. It's not because of anything we do for him. It's the word that we've accepted. It's his, it's his position and, and his, his anointing, his, his, the place that he holds in our lives. He is Savior and he is Lord. That cleans us. And as such, he calls us to abide in him and to allow him to abide, to remain in us. And what this tells us is that faithfulness, fruitfulness, is our choice. Listen closely. You can bear more fruit if you choose to. And the choice is more of you, Lord, and less of me. More of your ways and less of mine. More of your desires and a decrease in what I desire. It's about you. And only you. See, fruitfulness is contingent on remaining connected to whatever increases the life of Jesus in us, in you. More Jesus, friends, let me remind you, leads to more cutting away. You excited for more? Listen to what more requires. Less. Less in other areas. You see, friends, this is, this is the beginning of maturity. The Apostle John, uh, John the Baptist put it this way. He says, he must increase. I must decrease so that he might increase. He can't increase unless there's a decrease in you. And I leave you with this. And we're going to take communion and then we're out of here. Let me remind you what John 15, 17 says. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Now here's the thing. That sounds like a recipe of, yeah, I'm going to follow Jesus because ultimately I get what I want. That's not what he's saying. 
See, more of Jesus leads to more of his desires. Because as things begin to die away and lessen, those things that get in the way of an increase of his life, of his purposes, once it becomes about him, the desires we have are his desires. And therefore, he says, if you ask according to my desires, because they're now your desires, it will be done for you. Family, I leave you with this question, and we're going to take communion. Let's stand here today. What is Jesus telling you? What is he speaking to your life? What is he challenging you to do from this point forward? What does Jesus want from you? I pray that as we leave here today, after we take communion, that we will not leave with the same old mindset. Let me tell you what that means. That was a good service. I'm glad I went to church. What good is being the church if it doesn't produce change? What will you leave with today that's different? What is Jesus calling for change? What is he pruning in you, in me, in us, in his people tonight? We can't leave the same. We can't go back to old ways. I get it. You're better off today, but guess what? You're not meant to stay in where you are today. We're called to grow. God wants you to go to a next level of faith. A new revelation of his glory. A greater understanding of his purposes. Because he did not birth you to leave you stuck where you are as a new creation. There's more. 2024 really is a year of more. But just understand that more calls for an expansion in us. Let's talk to God. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here at Church of the Bridge today. I pray that you had a personal encounter with God, that he spoke to you powerfully, and that he met you at your place of need with this message. I also want to encourage you to go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube page. By doing so, you'll be able to check out past messages, uh, past events that we've done. You'll also be able to see what's happening now and those things that are to come. And lastly, I'd like to invite you to join with us in all that God is doing with your giving. Feel free to do so on our website. Again, thank you again for joining us, and I can't wait to connect with you next week.